Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich Duncan. I am uh, doing a, a talk today on um, uh, enterprise scale Jenkins. And really, uh, I, I sort of look at it as looking at Jenkins um, as an enterprise consumer, as a, as, a, as a sort of a large organization consumer of, of Jenkins. Um, we have been doing um, software tools, software productivity tools, consulting for 20-something years. Um, we've been working with Jenkins and a lot of the other open source tools that people typically use in the Jenkins setup for five or six years now or something along those lines. And um, really what I wanted to do today was sort of share some of the observations that we've had along the way in terms of what will help you all out in terms of making a better better environment for the people that will consume, consume Jenkins in your organization. Um, just to kind of get a sense of uh, the audience that we have here, if you could uh, show of hands, how many people work for you know, a large organization, Fortune 1000, and that sort of thing? Okay, quite a few. Uh, financial services? Okay. Uh, healthcare? A couple of those. Uh, medical? So good. Um, that, that gives me a sense that, that, that what, I, what I have to share is going to be something that's going to be important to you. Um, I look a little wired because I was up at 5.30 this morning. I had to fly in from Detroit where there was a raging thunderstorm. I'm pretty sure that like it was the seventh sign of the apocalypse or something, so uh, I'm a little bit rattled, but I'm going to try to focus and get this done. Um, so if you look at the kind of engagements that we do, I want to sort of set a context for our, our discussion here. Uh, we are typically working with an organization that started off with Jenkins that maybe was running in a lab environment, they were evaluating it. Uh, they had a small installation of it running. Um, they're looking to take uh, an in-production Jenkins uh, installation, they're looking to scale it up. Um, or they've got a, a particular set of concerns with their, with their Jenkins installation that they wanted an expert's help on. So that's, that's sort of where we come in. You know, from our perspective, uh, our typical engagement is to take some sort of evaluation of, of where the client is, um, to identify what the organization's goals are, uh, and to work out some sort of roadmap for helping them achieve their goals and then start off on some initial um, statement of work where we, we start to, to push, push in a direction with those goals. Um, what is our client looking for from their concern? What are, what are they concerned about? I think the biggest thing is they're looking for like, well, you know, how do I take advantage of the fact that you guys do this and, and we, we don't so much? Show us some best practices. Tell us if we're doing it the right way. Tell us where we're, we, we, could, we could do it a different way and why that would be better. Um, performance and scalability is always a concern, especially as, as organizations look to scale up their implementation. So uh, we get involved with that quite a bit. Um, for regulated industries, financials, uh, the medical industry, healthcare, uh, uh, audit and security is always an issue. So that's something that we run into quite a bit and uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, how do I control the, the environment that, that I'm, I'm putting out there? How do I, what kind of control should I put in place in my Jenkins installation to make sure that uh, um, it's properly controlled? And then we're looking to do, the client is typically looking to, to put together some, some technical transformation. I'm here, I want to be moved over to here. So, um, if you look at it from our perspective, uh, what we're also sort of adding to that list always is, uh, policies and procedures that help them manage their service. Because what, what always happens in a situation like this is uh, you're providing a service that the development community within your organization is using. And that service has to have some rules about how it gets used by the teams that are going to use it. Otherwise, you're going to run into conflicts. So a lot of, a lot of what we, we, we help work on is to sort of say, how do, we, how do we put together an environment that's going to be usable by you and consumable by your organization? It's going to meet their needs, and, and you're not going to run into, into pitfalls by not having those procedures in place. And we'll talk a little bit about what those are and, and why you want to do those. And, and the other thing that we're always looking at is, is organizational transformation in some way, shape, or form. Because you're always taking you know, a set of behaviors, you're introducing some new technology, and now you're expecting a new set of behaviors. But it, it doesn't work that easily. Right? It, you, know, you can't give a scalpel to a doctor or somebody who's not a doctor, not train them and think they're going to do surgery. A, tool, a, tool, a, a fool with a tool is a, a skeletal. 
And I think there's, there's part of what we need to do is to sort of take, take um, the fact that there's, there's got to be some, some soft skill work involved in some of these transformations because there's people that are dissenters that have, that have other, other points of view. And it's just natural, it's just the way people work. Um, and one of the organizations I remember we, we do a lot of work with, uh, somebody said, for anybody who's trying to push in this direction, somebody will arrive that will want to push back from the people in the opposite direction. So what do you do about that sort of stuff? I think a lot of what we, we do uh, is involved in that. So, um, you know, a part of, the, part of the things that we typically will look at when we, we first come look at a, a Jenkins installation is what, what do you have going on in it? So you know, Jenkins is defined by the plugin ecosystem, and a Jenkins installation and what it does is defined by those plugins. So part of what we'll do is we'll start to evaluate that kind of that kind of you know what they're doing with their plugins. Um, one of the things that always seems to happen is sort of the common anti-pattern is we call it like the bright shiny penny. Oh, look at that plugin, it's really cool. Oh, look at that one over there. It's really cool. Oh, job DSL plugin over here. Oh, you know, let's do this and that. And what happens is you start to put plugins, you see plugins that are locked into a, an installation. And without really understanding why or who's going to use it, but it, it might be useful, so we'll throw it in anyway. But it turns out that most of the problems that we run into in a Jenkins installation typically have a result to do with plugins that were causing problems, they were causing performance problems, uh, they were causing uh, jobs to crash. So, you know, there has to be a, a different way of, of putting plugins into an environment that has to do with something other than, gee, this looks like it be really useful. What we think that is, is, is based on some outcome that you want. So, you know, the way that, the, the way that we see this going together is if you're putting together a, an application, uh, you're configuring it, you're configuring it to provide a certain service to your client. And all that has to go together in the same way that the, the people that are using these tools develop their applications. You need to have goals, you need to have requirements, if you will, you need to know what your constraints are, you need to know what your priorities are, and from there, you can start to do a much better job of sort of selecting the, the plugins that you want, typically in a, you know, in a, in a less is better kind of way. So um, we, we want to develop a policy and procedure around you know, how plugins get added. Um, most organizations, have, 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 how many people are currently using Jenkins or Jenkins Enterprise now? OK, quite a bit. Um, so uh, how many folks are using LTS releases? Only a couple. OK. So you know, part, of, part of what we see is you know, if you want to, if, if you're looking for stability, if you're looking to get some, some um, um, organizational stability and stability about that. You're, you're going to want to go with an LTS release, but you're also going to want to have some sort of release schedule that you can start to, to indicate to your, your clients. It turns out one of the things that we see quite a bit is the Jenkins installation is you know, several re re revisions back. Um, people want to do new things with it, but the team involved is a little bit reluctant to want to do that. And that all comes with, you know, sort of like this is a natural thing that happens in the applications that your, your users are developing also. So you want to start developing procedures and policies that say, we will release you know, new releases of the platform on a periodic basis. They will, you know, we will have a committee that meets to try to decide you know, what new features the platform will take on. And in that, in, as part of that process, we'll put the plugins through a policy that basically says, you know, we've looked at them, we've researched them, uh, we, we, we need stability, therefore we're going to make sure that they're widely used, they're recently updated. They seem to be something that's actively pursued. Um, we went into a shop, uh, we, we probably do, I, I'd say, a, a few dozen, uh, we've done a few dozen installations so far this year. We do quite a bit of this. So, you know, and we, we kind of try to share our experiences. And um, one was, um, the, they were using a backup plugin that if you went onto the Jenkins page, it was basically saying, don't use this anymore, use two of the other ones over here. So, if, you, if you're not keeping up with this sort of stuff, that's So um, another kind of thing that we do is, is we, we, we always look at trying to, again, you know, what are the requirements? How will I put those requirements and manage those requirements with, with a set of plugins? 
but there's a few that we always think we, that, that you should consider if you haven't already. Um, one of which would be the job configuration function. Just, just because of the, the virtue of the fact that it lets you audit the, the, the changes that are happening to your jobs over time. Um, that is typically, in most organizations um, that have any regulatory constraints, there's usually some sort of audit requirement on systems, and this will help your Jenkins, your Jenkins, enterprise, your Jenkins installation at an enterprise level meet those audit constraints. Um, another one, uh, you can see, just, just uh, you've probably all seen this, or something like it, a plugin page for, for, for that. Um, audit Trail is another, another important plugin. It gives you the ability to, uh, to audit the actions that happen on the, uh, on the, on the, the Jenkins installation. So um, anybody who starts a job, anybody who changes the configuration of a job, deletes a job, um, runs a job, it, it all gets audited, and that's another major, major concern for most organizations that they have some sort of audit and traceability, and this will give you that. Um, promoted builds is an, another one that comes in quite handy. Um, there is a, um, some, one of, the, one of the things we'll talk about a little, about a little later on is there's always some question as to where promotion of a build happens in your environment. In some environments, the build uh, will put an, an artifact into uh, an artifactory or, or a Nexus uh, professional um, to, to house the artifact uh, as an intermediary or even if it's an artifact that likes to be deployed. Um, that may be the end of, your, of, of a release type build, um, but it may, it may not be because maybe there's another step after that that has to happen. And uh, it, it can be, you know, uh, a, a very much a sort of, you know, environment to environment decision as to how does promotion happen? But if promotion has to be driven by Jenkins, this is a great way to do it. It gives you the ability to sort of take a, take a build and do promotion steps on it, and that you, that you can essentially script build steps to, uh, to put a promotion through uh, whatever actions it needs to. They can be automated, um, they can be manual, and it, it will help you sort of you know, say, I took a build, I released it, I deployed it, now I want to have it tested, or maybe I want to have it handed over to uh, a deployment tool like uh, Excel Deploy, for example. Um, the Groovy plugin, how many folks use that? We find this one really useful uh, not only for scripting steps, um, but to find out what's going on inside the Jenkins environment. Um, we've had uh, about four or five uh, engagements where we've done um, plugin work for clients, where we need to take a plugin and understand a little bit why is it failing, or to understand how we might want to change the plugin to adapt it to something new. Um, the Groovy plugin, using the system, uh, a system uh, Groovy stuff. You can basically kind of poke around inside of Jenkins, Jenkins and obviously in a development, hopefully, server, um, to find out exactly what it's doing and, and, and how to make changes to a plugin. So this we find is a really easy way to do scripting, both from a job perspective. Um, a lot of times we've got um, needs to do uh, last couple of engagements, especially one I'm thinking of uh, in down in New York. Uh, we had to do uh, system audit reports that we couldn't get out of uh, any of the plugins that were available, it turned out they were really easy to script in Groovy. Uh, so we basically built the reports as Jenkins jobs. They would um, take the Groovy script out of uh, um, it and uh, run them and basically produce audit reports that would then um, massage the people with the sound or something like that to get them final form. So definitely useful here. Uh, conditional build steps is another one. Um, I'm actually having a talk with a friend before, uh, saying that, you know, a lot of times people are saying, well, you know, there's a file out there, the file exists, then I want to take another step, I want to run some certain tests, or maybe I need to delete the, uh, delete the file. Um, here you can avoid some ugly shell scripting uh, by using additional build steps, that's a pretty, pretty important one. And uh, a couple of others that, uh, we have a couple of guys that, 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 that do work for us that uh, like to build pipeline quite a bit, so I had to throw that in. Um, Ambient Inject is incredibly useful for defining environments inside your builds. And um, the job TSL plugin um, is, a, is, a, is a solid one for being able to build jobs that, uh, that maybe you need to uh, um, put together a certain you know, set of builds in a, in a consistent way over a large number of projects. Um, 
But the thing that uh, is definitely true is that you know plugins are good, but too many plugins is not a good thing. And you know your your use of these plugins will evolve. Maybe you're, you're, you'll see that uh, you've seen situations where you know somebody put a plugin or you know, three or four plugins in because they thought they were going to do X and then decided not to do it. You can at least if you don't un uninstall them, you can at least uh, mark them as disabled. Uh, that way that they don't they don't they don't install they don't take up memory they don't slow your your Jenkins startup down. And again, um, you should update them carefully. You should you should you know have a, a regular practice of, of looking at the plugins that you use and evaluating you know are they still being maintained are they still being used and and you know at some periodic basis make that evaluation and make changes accordingly. So. Um, a couple of other best practices that we find just you know helps this process of getting Jenkins out into an enterprise and, and makes it more uh, more palatable, more consumable, and just makes an easier time of it. Um, one of which is standardizing your slaves. Um, it's very easy, obviously, to get a slave up by installing a bunch of stuff on it by hand. I think, how many folks can pick your slaves by hand? I find that you know it's, it's the easiest, most expedient thing. It's certainly what we do in the lab when we're just trying to start out something. But the problem is that um, you you start to have as you configure slaves, if you get more and more of them, they're going to they're going to diverge. You're going to you're going to have drift between the configuration of one slave versus the other. And of course, if you've labeled a bunch of slaves and said they're the same, so you build to use them, but all of a sudden they start having variants, and then all of a sudden builds don't work because of those variants. It's just you know, over time you'll, you'll have that kind of um, if you have multiple slaves and they're configured, they're labeled and given to the builds to provide a certain stuff, set of things, you have to make sure that they're that they're identical. Um, a real good way to do this is to let Jenkins drive. Um, there is, you know, more and more now uh, the ability inside of Jenkins to control the way that tools get put onto the slave, so they can be downloaded from the internet. That's the sort of the default that most plugins follow nowadays. You can also download them from an internal site if, uh, if you're, if you're if, like most organizations, your production uh, Jenkins server can't get to the internet. It's very common not to let it. So you can have an internal site where those plugins can get downloaded from. You can also script the download, uh, do them from a file, from a share someplace, or an FS mount. Uh, that way you ensure that you're getting the exact same code and tool chain put on the servers the exact same way. You can, you can make sure it can evolve over time. So this is a big one. It, it really, as you start to scale up your implementation, um, these kind of problems where slaves are just diverging for some reason cause, causes all sorts of things. The build fails. It doesn't fail all the time. It just fails every once in a while. Um, how many folks let builds happen on their masters? This one, this one, I uh, direct experience with problems that this causes. And the reason is, is that you've got these builds that are coming along. They're consuming. You know, fairly reasonable amounts of, of memory, uh, you know, sometimes reasonable amounts of I.O., and a whole lot of CPU for the average, the average build. So that running on your master is going to start taking resources away from your master, and therefore your master performance from the user of the interface is going to seem spotty. Um, we have a client in New York who has um, completely wedged their master a couple of times just by having builds that are just you know, overwhelming it at a certain time of the day, just taking it down and the master fails and they have to restart the whole, the whole environment. So, um, always good to make sure that you have your jobs run on slaves and, and run on slaves only. I think the first thing we do nowadays, it's pretty standard, is to set the, ex ex the, set the executors on a, on a master down to zero. The other thing is, um, the security conscious of you, um, if you didn't realize this, because the master is typically running, as the Jenkins user, because it's, it's running underneath the same process space, um, you're going to now give that job the ability to go and just do whatever it wants in your Jenkins home. So it can, you know, the job can errantly or maliciously go make changes that you wouldn't intend to make. So even if you're going to run them on the same on the same system, you should run them as slaves on the same system with a different user ID so that they're they're protected. So if the job is running in a sandbox. That's separate from what Jenkins is doing. Now, in fact, when we set up admin jobs, that's typically what we do. 
We even run those on a slave, but we let that run in the same uh, security configuration that the master does. Uh, one question. Is the master knows now that the master can run independently, or if we wait till the master comes up? Say that again? Not yet. No, once 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 the master goes down, the connection to the slaves go down and they go away too. So so there's no high or no. Not 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 from a slave perspective. I mean there, and Jenkins Enterprise provides some high availability capability. Um, but I don't believe that the builds right now I don't believe that the builds are are salvaged between running from a slave to uh, running from a, a one high availability master to another, right chess? Not without, not, not without extra work. Is that fair to say? Well, that's extra. It's a good question, though. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that next. Um, the other thing is, um, this this slide went through several re revisions with uh, with my technical staff, and. Um, one of the versions was um, always do incremental builds. They're, they're faster and better, unless, unless you can't do them. And that didn't sound right, because it wasn't that they're incremental or that full builds are bad. So we were trying to think about it, and I, I thought about it a little bit more on the plane right here. And I think that you, you should build smart, meaning what, what do your jobs need to do, and what would be the most expedient way for them to do it? Um, and so. Um, then you can, you know, if you understand what you're trying to do and what the goal of a particular job is, um, then you're going to help, will help you craft a, a, a job that will meet that goal, and then um, you'll, you'll be in good shape. So, for example, um, what we typically do when somebody comes to us and said, hey, you know, we really want to do this, we really want to do Jenkins, we really want to do CI, or whatever we're, or whatever we're calling it today, um, and what, what would you recommend that we do? What kind of job should we do? And what we typically say is, um, well, you should have a job that basically runs on, on commit, you know, that will detect that a commit's happened and run and do uh, compile uh, and unit tests uh, on, that, on that build. How many people have a, a like what we, we call a CI job? How many people have those run? Okay. So, what's the point of that job? What's the goal? Someone. Help me out here, Brian. Yeah. It's, it's feedback to the development community. Hey, you know, good check -ins, right? Good commit. Uh, or not, right, because it broke, and now we're going to go fix that, because now, now we have code that's been checked in that doesn't work. So do we particularly care that we were really smart about making sure that we got exactly the stuff in Git, the, the latest Git commit, or can we just do, well, we can just do an update. We don't have to do a, a complete checkout of the repository. Or in subversion, we, we can do an update. We don't have to wipe it out and check it out. We're just trying to get the latest stuff to see if it built. And we're going to do it five more times probably in the next couple of hours anyway. So we don't have to make sure that we wipe the workspace clean. We don't have to get a fresh copy of everything. Do we really need to do, like if we're using Maven, do we really need to do, get, get all the dependencies down again? We can just use the ones that happen to be on the build server for this purpose. Now, another one that's very common is uh, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, the build that we do for release, that's the one where somebody, you know, a, a development manager is going to say, okay, we're ready to go. They're going to run a manual build, uh, put in whatever parameters that we need, run that release job. Now, on that kind of job, what do we want to do there? Probably almost the polar opposite, right? We want to make sure we have a fresh copy out of the repository to the code. We want to make sure that we, if we're, if we're getting dependencies, we want to make sure that those weren't tainted, perhaps. So maybe maybe we're going to go and, and, and pull the dependencies down again. Um, we're going to want to do, um, you know, the, the full compile. Now we're going to maybe want to do, in addition to the unit test, maybe the integration tests. And maybe if all that works, we're going to go queue up some regression tests and stuff like that. So, you know, the reason that we did all those steps is because of what we were trying to accomplish. And when you use that as your, your, your plumb line, you're really getting somewhere because you, you, you kind of eliminate the things that don't make any sense based on what you want. So should we, should we run our, uh, should we run um, uh, code quality analysis when we're doing the commit build? How many people would say code quality analysis on a commit build? 
Oh, good. Okay, we have one, one or two or three would say, so to say that they might. And, and, and you might, but you know, what, what we, again, this doesn't mean I'm right anybody who raised their hand But you know, I would say probably not is the reason would be, it's on a commit, so how much difference, how much difference in code quality was there on a commit to a commit basis? How much is it improving versus the cost of having to run a fairly expensive operation that's going to be time, you know, CPU and, 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 and time intensive? Uh, for what that So what we typically do is we have on, on one end of the spectrum, we say you should run a CI build. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got a release build. And we usually put something in the middle, something that goes either nightly or every other day. And that's where we do our regression testing, and, and, and that's where we also do our code quality analysis. Because we feel like the data is probably changed enough on, it, on some sort of period that goes from, from a night to a, a couple of days. So you know, if you, if you start looking at your jobs from that thing, what are they, what are they there to do? You start to, I think it really helps you to kind of you know, get to a point where you're, you're getting your job crafted the right way and you know it's doing the right thing. Um, of course, you should integrate with other tools. That's what, I don't know, 60% of the plugins do is you provide some useful integration with some tool that you want to use. Um, and under, under that it says, um, but use the right one for the right job. This, this one is, is, I think is tough. It's almost like Jenkins is a victim of its own success because there's so many different ways you can do a uh, given operation. It's up to the, you as a designer of this service for your company, it's up to you to kind of find the right way for the company, which has a lot to do with what tools are you selecting, what else is in your tool chain. Um, and, and again, since there's so many different ways, um, sometimes you'll see all of the ways being used, and of course that's gotta be wrong, it's gotta be an overkill. So you know, we'll see situations where um, code quality analysis is being run by Jenkins plugins, and then they're using Sonar running a Sonar plugin. Okay, well that, that, that just, you know, you're just overkilling there, you're providing a lot of value versus the, the time it's taking. So um, you have to look at the ways that are out there, you have to choose the best approach for the, for the uh, result that you are, and then, you know, look at the, look at the way that, the, you know, what you're trying, what you, what's required, and, and try to find a good way to, to do it. Um, so, last but not least, um, one of the things that I, I, I felt was important to cover was um, a little bit about why you would consider, if you're using open source Jenkins, what, what would be the compelling reasons for an enterprise to consider going to Jenkins Enterprise. So, um, with apologies to, uh, who was it, uh, can't remember the name of the comedian, you might be a redneck yet. Yeah. You, you might need Jenkins Enterprise there. And um, one of them is if your project portfolio includes applications that require a high level of attention. One of, one of the, one of the um, things that's very difficult to do is to say, um, I have a, a group with, with a, set of, a set of applications that they work with that are, uh, they, they're either, um, they contain a collection of property, they work with PII or, or, or something in that, in that area. And, People that work with those those um, applications are are specifically able to work with those applications, and no one else is to see those applications. There's a group over here; they work on a different set of extremely secure and, and proprietary information, and those people over here can work on those applications, but they can't see them. So, so typically in your organization, you'll get clearance. You'll be, you know, your manager will requisition the developers to be part of that group. Somebody will make a change, they'll be added to an LDAP group, and automatically they'll be able to get to those, those source repositories and be able to do the builds and the work that they need to do. Um, now we put those into Jenkins, and now you've got jobs for both of those groups. So we have a problem, because we've got one place where they both can get in, and how do we make sure that job, job A isn't seen by group B or group A can't see group B source code. It turns out to be a, a, a difficult problem to solve in, in, in open source Jenkins, and it's solved very easily um, with the Folders Plus plugin in the way that it, it deals with security. So this is one of those, those things where if you're, if, you're, if you're looking for that kind of capability, really in open source, it seems, to, at least from our analysis, the only thing you can really do is say, we have to have two different Jenkins servers for those. So that's the only way we can keep the credentials. Um, from inadvertently or maliciously being used uh, between those two jobs. 
that can be easily taken care of in, uh, in, in, uh, in Folders Plus. Um, also, in Folders Plus, you can, you can segment what jobs a different, different group of people can see by virtue of what folder those jobs live in. Otherwise, you'd be, you know, the, the job uh, would have to be programmed either with like DSL or, or man manually would have to go in to uh, the job matrix and say, you know, what groups of people can get to a job and be doing that on a job by job basis, which would be which would be very tough to do in terms of scale up. So um, that's one of the one of the things that really I think is, is important. So if you, you've got these kind of problems, this is a really great solution that we've, we've implemented a bunch. Um, similarly, highly regulated highly regulated industries, um, you get the ability to sort of you know show that you've got you know sort of um, a policy based way of, of securing your assets. These assets are secure; they're in this folder, and that way you know there's no way that somebody you know, is, is going along and you know job by job making configuration changes. Um, another one, obviously, is if you've got outages that uh, would cause problems. And honestly, if you're in, in a development organization with a few hundred developers and Jenkins goes down for half a day, um, that's going to have an impact. And it's going to have a monetary impact. Uh, not just, it's not just going to inconvenience people. People can't do their job. Uh, so there, there needs to be a way to take care of that. You can, you can craft individual one-off solutions, but you can't provide, an, you can't provide a, a vendor supply solution that you use the HA capability. Um, also, if you've got a large, um, a large portfolio of projects in uh, hundreds of projects, well, if you take 100 projects and the requisite number of builds that you're going to want to put together with those 100 projects, um, you now have hundreds of jobs, three, four, five hundred jobs. Um, now you have a maintenance problem on your hands. So the open source answer to this would be something like DSL, where you're, we're going to basically programmatically redo those jobs um, at some period of time. Or um, you're going to have a problem where the, the, I like it's a sort of, if you're uh, working on your house, the wallpapering problem, where the first, person, first piece of wallpaper I put up is awful. It's got rips in it. You know, if I had to take it down and hang it twice. And by the time I get to the end of the room, I really have a good idea of what I wanted to do. And the, the last couple pieces of wallpaper look good. This happens a lot when you're doing, when, you're, when you see organizations evolve how they want to do their jobs. And so if you don't have some programmatic way of going back and dealing, you know, when you're on job, you know, 700, uh, and you realize that this one is really good, now what do you do with all the 699 you just did that you want to update? You have a problem on your hands unless you use job DSL or if you use job templates. Um, we have um, found that the job templating capability um, is, is Really helpful to keep job jobs moving along. You know, we have five classes of jobs. They each have a template. Somebody wants to make a strategic change to the template. All of a sudden, um, you have made that change. You validated it. Now you can move that forward and affect every job that's associated with that template, including all the programming that can be added on top of it to do um, folders of jobs and that sort of stuff. So really, it's one of the biggest problems we see is like you know we've got a team that's responsible for an asset. They've got to be able to provision jobs in it, um, and that costs you. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a staffing cost that you can, you can avoid if you can do it smarter, and, and you can, you can evolve the platform a lot easier. Well, that is all I have to say. I'm happy to take some questions. All right. Thanks very much. Have a nice afternoon.